Hey guys, it's Mike Fraser, and I'm here to do a behind the scenes COVID testing at the Division of Consolidated Laboratories here in Richmond, Virginia. This month is National Laboratory Awareness Month. I got my mask on, I'm all signed in. Officer Johnson checked me in, checked my ID. I've got my ID badge, checked my temperature, sanitized my hands, and now we're gonna go back to the lab. I'm here with Dr. Griffin Thomas. She's the lead scientist for the COVID response in the lab, and she's gonna walk us through what an actual COVID test looks like and all the pieces of it. So thanks for showing us this. No problem. Great. So clearly that's a cardboard box. So clearly this is the shipper container and it's part of the kit that we provide to our customers for COVID testing. It's an insulated shipper because all samples should be transported to us refrigerated on ice packs. And so we do provide that insulated shipper. The actual contents of the kit will include a submission form, uh, which allows us to put in all patient metadata into our system, and then the actual specimen. So the specimen will consist of a vial of viral transport media, or VTM. It will then also contain the synthetic swab that we use for nasal pharyngeal collection um, or pharyngeal collection, as well as nasal collections. Um, and so this viral transport media is to preserve the virus so that we can have an acceptable sample come to the laboratory for testing to detect COVID-19. Um, and so the sample is labeled with patient information and that label and the information on that label is compared to the submission form to verify that we have received the appropriate sample associated with the correct form. Um, and this is the information that gets inputted into our laboratory information management system. Great, so that vial has a swab in it that looks kind of like a Q-tip. Is that just a Q-tip or what, what is that? It's actually not a Q-tip. This is actually a synthetic swab. Uh, most of them are considered synthetic Dacron swabs um, that are used. They're flocks, so they have these little bristles on them that enhances the ability to collect cellular material in the nasal pharyngeal so that we could detect the virus if it's present. Um, actually, cotton swabs are actually inhibitory to molecular testing, so we absolutely do not accept cotton or Q-tip swabs for testing here for COVID-19. All right, so we're at the next stage. We've got uh, samples in the bin that came out of our box, and Candace is sorting through them right now and racking them. And Haley's going to just tell us about that process. So we try to get all of the submissions together in a bin by site. That just helps us with the data entry process later on. Candace is going one at a time. She's opening the biohazard bag, making sure that she doesn't see any leaks with the sample. She's taking the form out. Um, there's five big things that we really need in order to get the sample processed. We need a patient name, the date of birth, where the sample came from, because we need to know where to send the results to. We need to know how it was collected, so what day it was collected, and what kind of swab it is. Um, once she checks that all that information is provided, she's also making sure that there aren't any discrepancies. So even one little letter off in the patient's name or a number being off in the date of birth is something that we want to definitely catch. If she does see any of those issues, she'll note them on the form. Once she's finished doing that, she goes ahead and gives it a quick little wipe down with bleach to make sure that if there were any leakages, it's not going to contaminate any of the other surrounding items in her cabinet, and then she'll move on to the next sample. Um, she's racking them in a certain order so that when we do get that information into our LIMS system, it's gonna be in the same order that her samples are in. Great, so LIMS is Laboratory Information Management System. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so what happens is all those pieces of paper get input by a person Correct. into the LIMS system. Yes. And that's where you can match the result to the person when it goes through the process. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we made it upstairs, our specimens are racked, and now we're in the extraction room. What happens up here? So what happens here is that the samples that were received downstairs are here to get processed. So one of the first things that we have to do is lyse the cells in order to release the virus if it's present in the sample. Um, and so processing happens here for lysis buffer to initially lyse and inactivate the sample. And then we have two different extraction platforms that we use in this laboratory that extracts the genetic material for COVID-19. Um, and then it's that extracted material that we then subsequently use 
for our molecular tests. Great. What's the difference between the two? Overall, they do the same thing. Um, we wanted to kind of di di uh, diversify the platforms that we use in the event of supply chain issues. Um, and so both machines do high throughput uh, nucleic acid extraction. They're just from different manufacturers. And really the only main difference is that you have one that processes in about 30 minutes, and then we have one that processes up to 96 uh, samples in about an hour. Okay, so they're manufacturer specific right. and you're using two. So if you run out of something for one, you can't use it in the other one. You cannot use it in the other, but it would still allow us to have capabilities from that extraction platform so that we can continue on with testing. Okay, cool. And did you say lyse the virus? Yeah, so we have to lyse the cells. So when you swab a person's nasal pharyngeic, it's gonna um, collect uh, cells from the patient. And if a person is um, infected with COVID-19, the virus will be in those human cells. And so in order to detect it, we have to release it from those human cells initially. So what looks like a pizza oven to me is actually a 75,000, maybe $80,000 piece of equipment that's gonna spend some time sorting out all the genetic material in here. It's gonna, it's gonna separate things, it's gonna spin it around. Mm -hmm. Spin it around. It's going to homogenize it. It's going to mix it. It's going to lyse it. It's going to clean up the genetic material so that we can have purified nucleic acid for real-time PCR testing. Great. It's going to be one hell of a pizza when it comes out. All right, so we're not at the last step yet, but we're at an important step. This is where the gold standard of a COVID test happens. Absolutely. So right. this is the real-time PCR setup component of our COVID workflow. So this is the last stop of the pre-analytical part of our testing workflow. But of course, once real-time PCR is complete, then we have to analyze and interpret the results. And so what Miranda is doing now is setting up the real-time PCR assay plate that has our purified genetic material that was extracted, um, in addition to some other reagents that's gonna allow us to specifically identify genetic material of COVID-19 if it's present in a patient sample. I'm here with Asia, who's a senior scientist, and she's gonna help us analyze the uh, specimen data that we got from all the testing steps that we saw. So tell us a little bit about what you're doing here, Asia. So once our instrument run completes, we have an interpretive software that very nicely analyzes the run for us based on a preset of requirements that we set up. It's a shared software. Um, we log in and we'll import the run in and then you'll see. So our positives are identified by color based on the formatting that we have already set up in the cover sheet. As you can see, the assay tests for three specific gene targets, uh, the ORF gene, the N gene, and the S gene. And then there's a control target, MS2, that's introduced at the extraction level. This is incredible. So this is bad news for some people. I think the news is different depending on the person and the patient and yeah. their medical history. So This has been an incredible journey. When I thought about a COVID test, I was just thinking about the vial and a swab. I wasn't thinking about the PPE, the people, all the supplies, all that equipment, the $80,000 pizza oven that's up there. Looks like it's spinning around yeah. and everything that's involved. It's mind boggling. How do you keep track of all of this stuff. There's a lot of steps. It's, yeah. a, lo it's a lot of planning, a lot of logistics, and, and a lot of coordination to make sure that the tests get done, they get reported out quickly, timely, and accurately. Well, this has been a wonderful experience. Dr. Tony, you have incredible staff. Dr. Griffin, Thomas was amazing. Yes. Haley, the whole team, thank you for letting us come in, take a tour, see how this works, demystifying a process that I think many people um, assume is a simple process, clearly not so simple. And for all the work that you're doing, as it is uh, Laboratory Appreciation Month, we want to again say thanks to you and thanks to your team. It's just incredible. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. And definitely wanted you all to know how appreciative we are of the work that you're doing in public health. And if you have further interest, be, be sure to visit our website, www.asso.org, or visit the APHL website, aphl.org.